Hello and welcome back to episode 52 of the Engage 8 podcast. I'm Michael with my co-hosts Zach and Josh. Today we are going to talk some March Madness. The first round is over, the round of 64 and round of 32. We're going to recap some of that and then get into some of the Sweet 16 and Elite 8 previews. But first, Zach is going to get us started with the hash mark segment uh, with some big NFL changes. Yeah, we had a we were kind of bombarded with a few tweets over the last 48 hours of new rules changes and policies that have been implemented. Uh, first off, the NFL trade deadline has been pushed back one week until the Tuesday after the week nine games. And the NFL also banned the hip drop tackle and that violation will be considered a 15 yard penalty. And the NFL is also planning to play another game on Christmas Day this year. So the teams are going to be playing on Christmas will also be playing the previous Saturday. So it will be viewed as a Sunday to Thursday turnaround, but instead it will be Saturday to Wednesday. So the big one that we got this morning was the NFL is changing their kickoff format. Uh, Josh, if you could do me a favor, throw that up on the screen. You can do that during editing. But uh, something that has been tried out in the XFL for a year or two, the NFL is adopting a new kickoff format. The ball will be set at the kicking team's own 35-yard line like normal, but the coverage unit will then line up at the opposing team's 40-yard line. Then there's a five-yard buffer zone, and then the receiving team will set up their guys at their own 35-yard line, aside from the uh, return specialist or two that they have in the back. And then the ball will have to land in the landing zone, which is from the 20 yard line to the goal line. And if the ball doesn't reach the 20 yard line, a touchback is going to be awarded at the 40 yard line. If it's kicked into the end zone, just on the fly, it'll be a touchback awarded to the 30 yard line. And then if the ball lands in the field of play, then rolls into the end zone, a touchback will be awarded at the 20 yard line. Now, the players can't move, obviously, other than the kicker or kickoff specialist until the ball is touched by the return team. And as it was before, if the ball goes out of bounds, it's ruled an illegal touching and the ball will be marked at the 40-yard line. But now teams are going to have to make it known that they are either attempting a normal kickoff or an onside kick. So it's kind of a big change. We've seen it for only a little bit of time. So I'm very interested to see if this kind of limits the amount of kick returns we see, or we just see a whole bunch of it with all the touchback rules. I don't think it's going to limit the returns at all. I think it's going to do quite the opposite. You see teams we saw all year this year, people just kicking into the back of the end zone. I think even though it's just five yards, I think taking that to the 30 definitely changes that. And then you obviously can't. What's the other thing? If you kick it short, it's to the 40, but that's, I mean, that's probably not going to happen much if ever. Uh, But yeah, I mean, it's incentive to go after and try to get kick returns, especially with the, bouncing in the field of play and then going into the back of the end zone will be 20 yard line, which is pretty non advantageous for the returning team. So um, I think we see a lot more kick returns. I think it'll be fun, uh, much better than what we saw this year, which was basically the removal of the play itself. As far as the kickoffs go, um, just a very interesting rule. Uh, we saw it in the XFL already. So we have some examples of what it will look like if you see it in the XFL, but It's very interesting. It's very different. Uh, I think it definitely will increase the amount of kickoffs returned. Uh, One thing it's supposed to be for is to prevent injuries, I'm pretty sure, which uh, if the NFL's goal is to prevent injuries, especially with the hip drop tackle, uh, it makes no sense why they would decide to play games on a Wednesday and Saturday, another week of short um, rest for players, something that'll cause just more injuries and hurt people's bodies more. So you're making these changes to try to help their bodies, but you're forcing them to play hurt. Uh, it's kind of just like a double negative or whatever, but that just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but I'm excited to see the new kickoff. It will be different, though. It'll be interesting to see how teams decide to approach it. All right. So with that, are we ready to move on to some first weekend recap of March Madness? See. All right. Moving on to the East region, starting off around a 64. Top three seeds, all crews in this region. Uh, Northwestern has a big comeback overtime win against FAU to move them on, them on to the second round. A hot UAB team uh, gave San Diego State uh, a lot of trouble, especially compared to San Diego State's second round game. Uh, but SDSU escaped that one. Biggest upset in this one, Auburn losing to Yale. Auburn is a great three-point shooting team. They're a great offensive team uh, who's actually pretty scrappy on defense as well, but they only make seven threes in this game, don't shoot it very well at all, and they get upset by a Yale team who turned out to be not very good. Um, the Kane, they stay hot, uh, weren't going to make the tournament. They stole a bid, then they get in here and they knock off a suspect BYU team. I wasn't too confident in this team. I know they were ranked high in, I believe, Net and Ken Palm, 
uh, all season, but I just was never too high on them. They lose to Decane in the first round. Uh, Drake, they were up big in the second half uh, versus Washington State. I believe they were up like 10 or 11 with uh, late in the second half, but then Washington State has a strong final few minutes there. Get the win over Drake to move them on to the round of 32. Uh, and then I'll just move, I'll just talk about the round of 32, and then I'll just pass it off to you guys for the to do these regions. That way we're not just going back and forth the whole time. But um, round of 32, there were no single digit games in this region in the round of 32. Uh, and I know there's a big, I wanted to talk about this, a lot of people online saying how this tournament's trash and whatnot. And like, I mean, that's what you're going to get with March Madness. You're going to either get a ton of upsets in the first re- weekend on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and everybody's going to be like, oh, this tournament's great. And then second weekend rolls around and the Sweet 16 games and the Elite Eight games suck because you have one seeds destroying seven and eight seed, or eight seed, I guess it's a bad example, but you get one seed destroying seven seeds and six seeds because they just had a Cinderella run of the Sweet 16. They run into a better team. This year, we don't see a lot of upsets in the first couple of rounds, but it's setting up for what could be a legendary Sweet 16 Elite Eight Final Four. So I prefer it this way, but the one thing I would want to not have that we had this year was a lot of, we had a ton of blowouts in the first weekend that I can get along with was not great. Uh, speaking of blowouts, UConn continues to be dominant. Northwestern was out of that game pretty early. San Diego state blew out Yale after that big Yale upset over Auburn, Illinois. They're one of the hottest teams in college basketball right now, especially offensively. Terrence Shannon is just insane. They destroyed to And then Washington state did stay in that game uh, against Iowa state more than uh, Northwestern Yale and Decane did. Uh, but Iowa State still gets a double-digit win and moves on looking dominant. Yeah, uh, mm, wow. Yeah, I don't have too many uh, games to talk about. I just want to touch base on a couple different teams. UConn, uh, I'm very interested to see how they're going to handle adversity once they face it within the next couple rounds. They've been severely outmatching the teams they've played so far, so I'm looking forward to see them in a tight close one and see how they finish it out. And then I'm really looking forward to see Illinois in the next few rounds as well. I think they have a really good chance to advance to the Elite Eight and maybe even the Final Four, depending on their matchups. And they just seem like they're out hustling the other teams they're facing. They're making those uh, those hard to make plays, the ones that don't show up on the stat sheet. You see uh, their point, their guards diving on the ground when they really don't need to be facing off against two defenders, throwing it, diving, getting the ball, throwing it off the leg, getting it out of bounds. And th- those are the plays that win you a national championship. And it wouldn't shock me to see that in this next round of the Sweet 16 or maybe even the Elite Eight that wins them a close game. Yeah, uh, speaking on UConn, they look phenomenal. They have dominated so far in the tournament. They've looked like the best team so far. They blew out Stetson, blew out Northwestern. Really not much of a fight. Uh, they're going to have a rematch. We'll talk about it here soon. Uh, national championship rematch against San Diego State, who did what they had to do. They struggled a little bit against UConn, but they were able to pull it out. Auburn, uh, very disappointing tournament. I had picked them to go all the way to the Final Four. Uh, they were really hot. They played great in the SEC tournament. They were blowing out teams, but uh, the SEC tournament is not the NCAA tournament. Uh, the success doesn't translate. Uh, they had an ejection early in the game. Uh, Chad baker Mazar was questionably ejected for a flagrant two. Uh, but even without one of your best players, you should still be able to beat Yale. They were not. Uh, BYU was upset by Duquesne. Uh, Duquesne came into the tournament high, like you guys said, and they were able to get it done. But Illinois, uh, another team that looks like one of the better teams in the tournament right now is a three seed. They won the Big Ten tournament. They finished the season very hot. Uh, Terrence Shannon Jr. is playing phenomenal so far in the tournament. He's been the best player on the court in each of their games. 26 points against Moorhead State, 30 points against Duquesne. Looks very good. Uh, Drake sadly uh, choked to Washington State. Uh, I like this Washington State team all year. Kyle Smith, uh, he did a great job coaching them. He, both those coaches from Washington State and Drake left. I can't remember where they went. Drake coach went to where was it Van? The, where did the Drake coach go? He just got hired. I can't remember off the top of my head. It's not Ohio State. Uh, West Virginia. He West went Virginia, to West Virginia, yeah. and Kyle Smith. I thought Tough he went weekend to... for Drake. By the way, just in general. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Kyle Smith, he went to Stanford. So both those coaches are gone. Uh, Washington State, I don't think they're in the Big Ten. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Iowa State looked solid against South Dakota State. It was a little close early, but they were able to pull away. Illinois, Iowa State is going to be a very good game. Uh, and Marcus Domask also had a triple-double against Moorhead State. I wanted to bring that up. First triple-double since he's phenomenal. Uh, Morant. Yeah, he's big guard. He's They're tough, man. My dad calls him dumbass. <laughs> but um, no, he's a hell of a player, though. Um, moving on to the West region, 
uh, round of 64. Top three seeds, Cruz, again, in this one, like I said, that's just what we had here, but I'm happy we have a lot of the best teams still in the tournament. Uh, Michigan State locked up Mississippi State in the first round. Uh, I believe they won that game by, like, 15 points. Mississippi State couldn't do much offensively. looked pretty lost for much of the first half and a lot of the second. Grand Canyon and their electric offense upset St. Mary's, a team that I thought could go far. I think in my bracket on here, I think I had them going to, like, the Elite Eight or something, or at least the Sweet 16. Uh, they lose in the first round to Grand Canyon. Uh, phenomenal offense. Another phenomenal offense, Bama. They give up 96 points in the first round, still win by 13. Uh, their defense is just so horrible, but their offense is so good that it just cancels out. Um, they are what Kentucky should have been. Um, Clemson dominates New Mexico and Patino. That was a popular upset pick, pick in New Mexico. I think they might have. They were favored. I'm pretty sure going into the game uh, in Vegas, uh, but they could not get the win. Clemson dominated that game from start to finish. Showed that they were a pretty overlooked team going into the uh, tournament here. And now, have you guys seen the Richard Pertino rumors? I have not. He's being talked to by Louisville. Oh wow! Could you imagine, bro? Could you? Imagine? I can't see that happening. That'd be crazy. That would be hilarious. I'm rooting for that though. That would. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would. I just don't see it. Like, if they do hire him, it's literally only because he's Patino. Because let's be honest, he does not deserve that job yet. I've seen so many. He people... sucked at Minnesota, and he was okay this year in New Mexico. I've seen a couple people linked to that job. I can't think of them off the top of my head. Oh yeah, they're they've because they have they've hired like they, they won't five different guys though, already. But yeah, yeah, they've talked to everybody though. That's just Louisville. They'll figure it out maybe in twenty years, but um. Moving on here, uh, last game I got here for the round of 64, Nevada. They were up 17 in the second half against Dayton. They blow that lead to Dayton, who's just not a very good team, especially for a seven seed. Nevada absolutely should have won that game. That was just an embarrassing, embarrassing loss for them. Um, round of 32 here in the West region. Uh, Michigan State was in the UNC game early, uh, but UNC just went on that run about halfway through the first half, and they just really never gave the lead up after that. It ended up being just an extended run. Uh, so UNC moves on uh, fairly easily in their first two games there, uh, despite a rough start against Michigan State. Uh, Bama kept a mid-level lead on GCU for most of the game. They were up by like seven and eight and six for a lot of this game. Uh, GCU just couldn't get any closer than like four or five. They couldn't quite close the gap in that game. Alabama pulls away a little bit extra late. I believe they won that game by 11. Uh, Clemson, who in my opinion is the most shocking Sweet 16 team, beats Baylor pretty easily. Uh, led most of the game. Um, I don't know about like if it was like three two or something for Baylor, but from when I was watching, Clemson was ahead the entire time. And then Arizona led Dayton throughout. Dayton made some pushes like late in the first half, but Arizona is just too sound offensively. They played solid defense against uh, Dayton, and when you got bucket getters like Caleb Love, like you're gonna be in a good spot regardless. But yeah, um, a lot of chalk in this one as well. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, North Carolina kind of just taking care of business as they went along. Sorry, Mike. I, I was rooting for Michigan State in the second round, but just didn't work out. They were in there for a little bit, though. But Bama just, I said it before and I'll say it again, they're going to have to rely on their offense in order to win in this tournament. And they have done so, especially in the round of 64, winning 109 to 96. That was kind of nuts. And like you mentioned, Josh Clemson somehow coming out on top against New Mexico and Baylor and working their way to the Sweet 16. A little bit of a preview for me. Uh, I don't think they make it past Arizona because they are pretty good. And like you mentioned again, Josh, Nevada uh, kind of grasping uh, defeat from the jaws of victory in that 17-point choke. So that's really unfortunate for them. But I, once again, I'm very excited to see North Carolina try and keep up with Alabama coming up. And I think probably the winner of that game is going to work their way to the Final Four. Yeah, just a quick, I don't know if you can consider this breaking news. Uh, I just wanted to say it. We could have waited till next round, but I'm going to say it now. I don't know if you guys have seen this, considering you're both Kentucky fans. But John Calipari He's not will remain the yeah. head coach at Kentucky it, University. It was after his radio show yesterday, it was pretty much confirmed. Yeah, so. You, you, I would have been genuinely blown away if you had something in actual, <laughs> something to say there. Yeah, it is official, though. I was, I was interested to try to. <laughs> see how you would react he's, to that. He's on, he's on the recruiting trail. He did his radio show yeah. yesterday. I mean, there's who else are you going to hire? Yeah. Speaking yeah. of another guy on the recruiting trail, Tom Izzo is on the recruiting trail. Unfortunately, uh, after losing to North Carolina, uh, they got ahead earlier. They were up 12 
pretty early into the game, 12 minutes in, and then just a couple bad turnovers let North Carolina back in it right away, and we're really never able to kind of get back in the game offensively. Their defense struggled for most of the game. Uh, their upperclassmen struggled late in the game. Uh, unfortunate that they were unable to put a great team around guys like Tyson Walker and Malik Hall, who are phenomenal college players and will be graduating and won't be able to have another chance at the tournament. But North Carolina, they looked good. They were able to get out of the re- of the first weekend. Uh, Grand Canyon, they looked very good in the first round. Fun story. They had a lot of fans there, even though who knows if that's a real university or not. Uh, Alabama, they continued what Alabama does, scored 109 in the first round against Charleston in a point battle. Uh, Arizona, they continued to look solid. Uh, they were able to get a pretty easy first weekend with Dayton and Long Beach State trying to set up that potential Caleb Love versus UNC rematch to see how that goes. And uh, I'm with you, Josh. I think Clemson was kind of my surprise of the weekend. I was not expecting them to get out of the first round, but they did. They beat up New Mexico. We were able to beat Baylor, who we had talked about, um, struggling away from home. And uh, their coach possibly being a one championship merchant, which might be true. He's... Struggle to get out of the round of 32 and that's, otherwise. that's who Kentucky fans want. You guys want Scott Drew? Yeah. Shit who, doesn't make no sense to me, bro. You look get at his last 10 tournaments. Scott Drew. Come on, no, uh. I love Scott Drew, but struggling the tournament outside of He's one not a big Kentucky run. Guy. Yeah. Um, but another, like you said, bracket with chalk, one, four, two, and six. Uh, only really, only one double digit seed advanced to the round of 16. So, uh, could be a good matchup. We'll talk about. Yep, moving on here to the South region. Uh, Houston, Marquette, Duke, and A&M all cruise. Uh, JMU upsets Wisconsin. When Wisconsin can't shoot, they just don't play well, uh, and it caught up to them in this game. Opposite of the Big Ten tourney, when they figured out how to shoot for a few games and they went on a run, got all the way to losing to Illinois in the championship. Could not do that here. JMU upsets them. Uh, NC State, DJ Burns, DJ Horn, they stay hot, beat another mid-level Big 12 team. Um and in Texas Tech, as uh, Baylor, I'm trying to think of who were the other BYU, the other mid level Big 12 teams that lost. Um, Kentucky lost to Oakland. Um, it is what it is. Jack Olkey couldn't miss. Um, luckily, we won't have to worry about him next year, considering he's 24 playing against a bunch of 18 year olds. Uh, some of these guys were in seventh grade when he was a freshman in, <laughs> in college. So it is what it is. Uh, the zone. Rattled Kentucky bad. They just were not prepared for the zone. I think that's why Calipari is getting a lot of criticism right now is because of that. Kentucky has never played well against zones. John Calipari's offense just does not play well against zones. Teams know that. I don't know why more teams don't play zone, but they got in a situation here where they weren't prepared for it, similar to St. Peter's at times, and it just didn't work out for them. Kentucky couldn't rebound at all. A lot of long rebounds. When you're when you're chucking bad shots, and I'm going to say bad shots, even for Golkey, those are bad shots. When you're chucking those and you're missing them, it's going to be a long rebound. Your guards are going to have to go out there and try to rebound. Kentucky's guards are crashing the boards. The ball is going over their head. It's just simple mistakes that, like that that cost him. Reed Shepard was not good. He had the yips, it looked like. Dillingham at his moments. Reeves was great. Um, it was a tough one, man. It's a tough pill to swallow still a week later. Um, this was a team that should have been significantly better than they are or than they were. Uh, one of the better recruiting classes in Cal's era, the best uh, offensive Kentucky team in over two decades. Uh, this team just could never figure it out defensively. They were a little too young for the moment. And like I said, I mean, when you got kids who are out here 18 years old, 19 years old, playing against grown-ass men who are 24 years old, I mean, that's a problem maybe more with the NCAA and giving out free COVID years to everybody, but that's a completely different conversation. Um, like I said, everyone wants to fire Calipari. Um that just doesn't make sense to me with his recruiting prowess. There's not many better options. Like I said, who do you want to fire or who do you want to hire? Scott Drew? Like, come on, man. What are we doing here? You're not going to go get Nate Oates. Nate Oates is a guy who could coach at Kentucky, maybe. The thing with Kentucky is it's not like all these other like solid schools. Like, I hate to use your team as an example here, Mike, but when Izzo's gone, like any good coach can go coach Michigan State. Like, just because you're a good coach doesn't mean you can come coach at Kentucky. Like, you have to be – I know Matt Jones was talking about this earlier this week. You have to be a rock star. Like, the only two guys that can really coach at Kentucky right now are John Calipari and Rick Pitino. 
those are the only two ones. You got to have that swagger to you. You got to be ready to just get beat up every day because you're going to get nothing but criticism. It's just a ruthless fan base. And got like Scott Drew isn't built for, dude, he would be done after a year of the Kentucky hate, bro. There's no chance he could handle it. So everybody that wants Calipari out, just when that day does come and your wish comes true and we go and we hire a guy like Scott Drew or Eric Musselman, and they get destroyed by the Kentucky media, and they can't handle it, I think you're going to be missing when you had Cal, who knew how to handle it and could handle it. But moving on past the Kentucky game, Florida and Colorado, they combined for 202 points, which is just insane. 102 to 100. Colorado wins in a shootout there. Those teams combined for 100 points in the paint that game, which is insane. Um, Round of 32, Houston and A&M, they play in a ref show game, but – it was a phenomenal game, one of the better games of the weekend. Houston is the better team. Uh, they overcame some foul trouble. They had a bad whistle, elite shot making uh, from AM came late in that game. They still overcome all that and get the win. Uh, Duke blows the doors off James Madison. That was a cute little upset. Thought maybe James Madison could hang in that Duke game. They just get the doors blown off them. Duke's playing good ball now somehow. Um, it just seems like they were pl- not playing their best ball towards the end of the year, and then all of a sudden they get in this tournament and they're winning games. But uh, we'll see what – what comes for them when they got they got Houston in this next round, right? Yeah, Houston. All right, we'll see Duke out of here real soon. But um, NC State and Oakland played in a barn burner. Uh, NC State dominated in overtime, got the win, uh, got Golki out of there. I think what did Golki shoot like six for twenty from three or something? It was something. It was something stupid. Bad. Like, <laughs> yeah, Trey Townsend though is a dog. He is a dog. He is a dog. But I mean, how, he's old as fuck too, though, isn't he? He's just a normal senior. He got a nine to five. <laughs> He's a normal senior. He's going to be a grad transfer this year, most likely. Yeah, everyone's a grad transfer now. Um, Marquette outlasts the Colorado team that was playing well. Uh, Kolick, I think, is as good as any guard in the tournament right now. He's phenomenal, man. He's such a good passer. When he gets to his left, he's almost impossible to stop going to the rim. Uh, he's phenomenal. He's one of the better guards in the tournament. But a um, little more drama, I guess, in this one as we have the five seed lose, the three seed lose. Uh, but still, you still got the one and two seed in there. The four seed was dominant. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Houston kind of took care of business to start out, and then they were in a real close one with A and M. Did they go double OT? I think, and then A and M was shooting like forty five free throws or something like that. It was insane. But uh, Nebraska, a team that I think I picked to beat A and M because I was confident in their ability to get hot, they just got their. Uh, they just got shut down early on and just couldn't really keep up. But kind of going all the way down to the Kentucky game, I remember I texted you partway through the first half, Josh, and I was like, who does this white boy think he is? Because I remember watching them like a minute or two into the game. They were like, yeah, this kid, he shot like 335 shots this year, and only eight of them were twos. And I'm like, that that's me during LCYB and intramurals. Like, I don't step inside the arc unless it's like an accident where I got a KD foot where I'm stepping on the line. And then all of a sudden he's chucking these, like you said, bad shots. But it's very Paul George-esque of you because if they're going in, how bad can they be? And I mean, I was with Paul George there. I'm I'm with I'm with me now. (laughs) He's just uh, he's he was sparking. I mean, it. It's just a shame that two out of the last three years we run into just the random white guy who just decides to put his business administration on hold. He's at least good though. Eater I sucked. Know, but like, yeah, Eater was, Eater he sucked. just came out of nowhere though. Well, he was for either way. It's just a shame we ran into two guys who decided to put their business administration degrees on hold just to yeah. create some chaos and March Madness for a little bit. But um, Eater was at least a little at? younger too, though. I mean, this guy's right, and he, he had a nice little stash, and I think he had a slight perm going on, some nice curls, Perm's but. Crazy. <laughs> But um, yeah, Marquette took care of business in the first round, almost lost to Colorado in the second round, but them against NC State is going to be a really interesting one next round. And God, I I, I hate Duke with a passion. It's strictly because of that TikTok kid. Oh my God. I was praying for JMU to just beat their brakes off, but it was the Yeah, reverse. but Caleb Williams is great. <laughs> I mean, Pick a side. It, it's just different when it's your own team, I guess, but <laughs> I'd rather my guy be a vibing on the sidelines of a March Madness game rather than singing two days into college on TikTok over and over again. So maybe that's just a little bit of bias, but that's where I stand. Um, but yeah, I mean, NC State and Marquette's going to be an interesting one. And hopefully Houston, just like you said, Josh, gets Duke out of there soon. I just want to say about Golki really quick before you go, Mike. He 
I do want to give him credit because he is really good. Like, I mean, his jumper's obviously <laughs> phenomenal, uh, and he's a great shooter. But he does have one of those shot selections that in the Kentucky game, it's great. You're America's sweetheart. You're the best player in the world because you're making can, got shots with two hands in your face. But when you're not making that shot, you're the number one hated Looking person like on your team. <laughs> Everybody, that's just not a. It's not a way you win games. I mean, you can win a game like they did against Kentucky if you hit all those shots. But as soon as you don't start hitting them, i.e., the next game. I mean, there you go. I agree with you, but at the same time, NC State was able to watch that Kentucky game and just see that he couldn't miss and you have to be on him no matter what because considering how hot he was. So I think you defend him differently when you're NC State versus Kentucky. And Kentucky also he had some tough shots, though. Kentucky adjusted to he him. He had some tough shots. They yes. adjusted to him. like it, it was gross. He was just making them. Like the first, his first few were open and I was like, all right, get the fuck on him. And then they were putting right. like damn near two on him off ball. Yeah. Like they were Reeves Calvin and, Johnson uh, guarding Shepherd him. Shepard were kind of like, yeah. they were getting on him and all that. They like, threw everyone at him. Everyone guarded him, bro. Like, yeah. it was just insane. Uh, but yeah, shout out Jack Golke. What a win for Oakland. I liked them a lot going into the tournament. Uh, I just thought Kentucky's offense would be able to outscore them. Uh, I should have trusted my gut. I had watched them in the semifinal of the Horizon League tournament. I, and they showed the stats of him only having like seven two-pointers attempted and like 300 threes. I was like, wow, that's just crazy. I wonder if <laughs> you just don't think of it twice. And then all of a sudden you go to the round of 64 and he's out there just chucking threes and playing phenomenal. He was Make great. Trey, league. Trey Townsend was great. And after looking it up, he is younger than you, Josh. So Trey don't Townsend's hate on him. younger than me? Yeah. Damn, that's crazy. Yeah, barely, barely. But how um, is he gonna be? How is he a senior then? I don't know. Uh, but he was born on August thirtieth of two thousand and two. Bro, skip the grade, I guess. <laughs> Great player though. Um, ho- hopefully he goes to a power one school and is able to go off. Houston, uh, they struggled in the first round. Really, the only one seed to struggle. Uh, they struggled against Texas A and M. Didn't blow them out over time. They had four players foul out. Their two good guards fouled out. Um, but they were able to overcome that. Uh, they went through adversity. And hopefully for them, this will help them throughout the tournament. They've played in those close games. The other number one seeds really haven't had those close games yet, so maybe they would succumb to the pressure later. That'll be interesting to see. James Madison just bullied Wisconsin like we predicted. Uh, they are very good. Unfortunately, they weren't able to go into the game against Duke with that same mentality as Duke just bullied them. Easily won by about 40 points. Uh, Filipowski played good. Jared McCain was phenomenal, though. Uh, he dominated the first two rounds. Uh, got a shout-out to him, I guess. NC State continues to be the best story of the tournament so far. DJ Burns gets them through the first weekend. They beat Texas Tech pretty easily, and then they had one of the best games of the tournament against NC State Oakland. Uh, but the best game of the tournament so far for me is the Florida versus Colorado game. Very close. Colorado came into the tournament hot. Looked very good. Walter Clayton Jr. was phenomenal for uh, Florida. He hit the three from about the logo to tie the game. And then Colorado was able to come down and hit a basically a buzzer beater to win. Uh, great game. Both teams scored almost uh, well over 100. Marquette struggled a little bit against Western Kentucky early. They were down, but they figured it out. One went into Colorado and won. Uh, this is so far, in my opinion, the best region in terms of excitement. Uh, really, only the Duke James Madison was the main blowout. But uh, a couple of great Sweet 16 matchups. All right, moving on to our final region here, Midwest, uh, round of 64. This is a lot of blowouts in this region. Um, Purdue, Tennessee, Creighton, Gonzaga, Utah State, and Oregon all cruised in the first round. Kansas played in, the sa- in an insane game with Sanford, but the refs played a big factor. This showed, at the very least, Kansas' vulnerability even more than we already have seen over the past month. We knew they were just a, a ticking time bomb, and we saw very soon that they were. Um, Texas led for a lot of their game against Colorado State after I think they went down like 10-2 or 8-2 early, and then they went on a huge run and led for the entire game. Uh, Colorado State fought back a little bit, but it was just never enough for them. Uh, moving on to the round of 32, Purdue dominated Utah State throughout. They were looking like one of the more dominant teams in the tournament. Uh, that was just an impressive game. I thought going in that could be a tough game for them, uh, but it ended up not even being a tough game at all. They were, of course, Utah State was in it in the beginning. They didn't get blown out like right out of the gate, but I think Purdue ended up winning that game by, what, 40 or close to 40 at the end? 39. Uh, yeah, dominated. That was a phenomenal game from them. Zach Eady is 
looking to win that most outstanding player, but they got some tough games coming up. I like I said, I worry about that Creighton game for them. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, Gonzaga let Kansas hang in there for the first half, but the Zags just dominated a fraudulent Kansas team in the second half. Uh, they had nothing going for them. Losing McCuller for this tournament just it was a nail in the coffin for Kansas. Speaking of Creighton, Creighton and Oregon went into two overtimes, but Creighton dominated the second overtime like I've never seen a team do before. It was like the game, like it wasn't even a close game for the first, whatever, 45 minutes. Like they dominated that second overtime, all time spread cover uh, for them to go from losing a game late to covering like eight or whatever it was. Uh, great for them. Tennessee played a tight game with Texas, and Texas had a lot of chances to win this game, especially late. Uh, but Tennessee is just a better team than them, and they showed it. Uh, Tennessee is another team who I think is just going to meet their match soon. Uh, I don't think they'd be Creighton, but we'll get to that later. Yeah, I mean, the main elephant in the room is Purdue just dominating their way to the Sweet 16. They look like they're on some different shit, uh, some different timing this year, and they're proving it. They're playing really well. Uh, headlined by Edie, who's, like you said, coming for that most outstanding player of the year. Uh, Tennessee and Creighton, I mean, I guess you could say they're both taking care of business, even though they both had uh, tough second-round games even though Creighton, they may have won by 13, but it took two overtimes to get there. So use that information uh, how you will. Tennessee only beating Texas by four, but they got it done. That's what you got to do. You just got to survive in advance. I hope Creighton beats the brakes off of them. We don't know, though, uh, and I hope the Zags take out Purdue, but, I mean, what have the Zags proved so far? I mean, Kansas has been hurt. They were, they're not that impressive anymore, and McNeese is, I mean, cool name, but I don't know. So it's good. That's an interesting sweet 16 for me. Maybe, maybe it's just because of the chalk, but one against five and then two against three. I think we should see some good games. Yeah. Purdue after a rough start against Grambling, uh, they were able to get it going. Uh, you know, early in this game, this game was pretty close. Uh, and you almost with Purdue after what we saw last year against FDU, you think they might choke and they did look a little nervous out there, uh, but they were able to get it done in the second half. They dominated and they went in uh, to that, Round of 32 game against Utah State and just dominated Utah State. It was never close. They were up by like 40. They were playing Purdue basketball. They looked very good. And they're going to go up against a team, the Gonzaga, that looked very good as well. Uh, I liked McNeese a lot going into this tournament. Uh, and they just destroyed them. It was not a close game at all. Uh, they picked it apart their top-ranked defense. They hit their open threes. They hit their threes. They passed phenomenally. Nemhard was phenomenal. Then they went against Kansas, who played great in the first half and just bullied them in the second half. Uh, this is the best this Gonzaga team has looked all year. Uh, they're going up against Purdue, and this is going to be a phenomenal matchup. We'll talk about that in a minute, though. Uh, Creighton was able to beat Oregon pretty easily and then went against they beat Akron easily and then went and played Oregon, who upset South Carolina pretty easily. Dante looked good. Uh, Cousinard looked phenomenal. He was great. And in that double overtime game, I thought Oregon, they had chances at it. I thought they would get it done, but, uh, Creighton was able to outlast them. They had the better overall team and they're able to continue and win Texas. Uh, Colorado state was a rough game to watch. Texas was able to pull away Tennessee. They were able to beat St. Peter's who was, uh, in St. Peter's. They don't have Doug Eater and Shaheen Holloway anymore. Uh, Tennessee, Texas, another game where Dalton Connect didn't look good. He didn't look good really in this weekend. He didn't look good at all, but they were able to get it done without him playing his best basketball. Uh, Texas tried to fight back late. They were unable to. Uh, but Texas, or Tennessee Creighton is going to be in another pretty solid matchup. Uh, SEC didn't have the greatest uh, tournament so far, but they're able to get two teams into the Sweet 16. Not bad. All right, with that being said, we will move on to our preview for this weekend of the Sweet 16 and the Elite 8. I believe we have 12 games to go over here, so we'll start here with the rematch of the national championship from last season, UConn and San Diego State. Do have UConn winning this game. If there's one thing that I have taken from the first weekend, it's although I thought before by a society, I thought Houston was the best team, I have changed my mind, and I think UConn is the best team. And I think they're the scariest team. They just have everything. They can shoot you to death. They have rim protectors. They can guard. They have championship prowess from winning it last season, although they didn't bring back a ton of people from last year's team. And Dan Hurley is just one of the best coaches. He is one of the names that can coach at Kentucky, by the way. Just adding that from what I said before. He is one of the people who you could hire, but he's never leaving UConn. Um, 
So I got UConn winning that game. Illinois, Iowa State, this game has potential to be the best game of the weekend. I am so excited for this game. You got one of the best offenses in all of college basketball in Illinois and one of the best defenses in all of college basketball for Iowa State. It's almost like that the diet of the Houston-Kentucky game that we were talking about last week. Um, oh, man, I'm back and forth on this one. I'm going to go with Iowa State, though. I'm going to trust the defense here. I know Terrence Shannon is going to go get you 30. That's not going to be a problem. It's going to be, can you go and stop a guy like Domas? Like, what can you do if you're Iowa State to limit everybody around, around uh, Terrence Shannon? Because he's going to be great. You just got to make sure not nobody else is great. I think Iowa State does that. I'm very, very confident in them still. But moving on in this game, UConn versus Iowa State, I am going to take UConn to go to the Final Four for all the reasons I just said. They do a little bit of everything. They don't have any holes in their game. They don't have any glaring weakness that you look at them and you're like, oh, this is what's going to kill them. The only thing that can kill them is just playing another team who's as good as them. And I think they're better than Iowa State, where we sit right now on March 26, 2024, and I have UConn going to the Final Four out of the East region. So for UConn and San Diego State, I not only think UConn is the better team of these two, but like you mentioned, Josh, they're one of the best teams in the entire tournament. I have them not blowing past San Diego State, but I have them winning. And call me a homer, but I mean, I'm going Illinois over Iowa State. Uh, Yeah, Iowa's got the defensive advantage, and usually in these games, you sink to the level of your training. And if a really good defensive team is out there, you got to bank on them. But I don't know. Maybe I'm just a little bit biased. I'm going Illinois with that. And the bias is going to show again. I'm going Illinois over UConn. It, maybe I'm just picking an upset just to be quirky. But I don't know. I want to see Illinois in the final four. And I want to see them make some noise in this tournament. Yeah, I want to see them make some noise too as a, a Big Ten team, which has had a better tournament than they've had in recent years. Uh, they did pretty well in the first round. Uh, but the teams you expected to kind of fall off did. But you still got Illinois and Purdue, who we'll talk about in a minute. But I got Illinois beating Iowa State as well. I think Terrence Shannon is playing phenomenal. Uh, if Coleman Hawkins can get it going and Domas can keep it uh, playing great. Uh, they've Dane Danger has been phenomenal for them as another big man. Uh, I think they're going to be able to get it done against Iowa State. And then UConn-San Diego State, a game of uh, a national championship rematch from last year. If there's a team that's going to want to beat UConn, it's going to beat San Diego State, obviously. Uh, they want to get their revenge. They want to get back to that point. Uh, but I think UConn is just better overall. Uh, I think UConn's going to win. They are showed that they're probably the best team in this tournament. So I think they beat San Diego State. And then UConn, Illinois, as much as I want to pick Illinois to win, UConn has just been dominant so far in this tournament. You really, It's hard to pick against them. So I'm going to go with UConn to go to the Final Four. But uh, go Illinois, I guess. I All right. Say. Moving on here to the West region, North Carolina and Alabama. Uh, this is going to be another game that I'm really looking forward to. Alabama is a better offensive team than North Carolina, although North Carolina is a phenomenal off- offensive team. And then UNC obviously has them on the defensive end. That doesn't take much. But um, I'm going to go with UNC. I don't think Bama's going to be able to hold like Bay High in their inside presence just to go along with RJ Davis, who's going to go out there and get you 30. He's just a phenomenal guard. I think that's going to set up for a potential great matchup of RJ Davis versus Caleb Love. And with that being said, I am going to go with Arizona beating Clemson as well. Clemson, like I said, was my number one shock to get here. I still can't believe they're here. Arizona's a great team on on offense, and they got guys like Balo who could help out on defense when they need them. Um, so I have them beating Clemson. And then Arizona versus North Carolina, a game that everybody's kind of all college basketball fans have been fantasizing about all season, getting to see Caleb, uh, Caleb Williams, Ooh, Caleb Love, uh, <laughs> it's on your mind playing against UNC. Rent free. Yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of Caleb Williams stuff in the news today. I don't know, so um, <laughs> I'm not gonna get too deep into it. But if you know, you know. Um, <laughs> Arizona and Caleb Love playing against UNC, and I'm gonna go with Arizona here. I I just trust Caleb Love more than R.J. Davis, although they're both phenomenal guards. Uh, Baycott is also great, but I think Balo can hold his own with Baycott down there in the paint. I think this will be a very, very, very close game if we do see it, but I give the edge to Arizona as I think they're a little bit more well-rounded than UNC is, so I would have Arizona moving on to the Final Four at in Phoenix to play against UConn. In our last episode, I believe I picked three out of these four teams correct. I had North Carolina, Alabama, Arizona, and I think Baylor making it to the Sweet 16. So I'm going to kind of stick with that blueprint. I think Alabama is going to beat North Carolina. I just not that I trust their offense or their defense for that matter, but I'm going to just say that Alabama gets hot and they just score a million points. 
So I think North Carolina gets a little upset and Bama moves on. And then I'm going Arizona over Clemson. Uh, Clemson, like you guys mentioned before, they are kind of a shocker to be here. But I do think Arizona is the better team. And I have the battle of the A logos and Alabama and Arizona in the Elite Eight. I'm going Alabama. I'm going to stick with my previous picks and just stay on business. Yeah, North Carolina, Alabama. I think it's going to be a really fun game. Uh, a couple of great guards in this game. Uh, but I'm going to stick with the ACC. They've looked great all tournament. They've been maybe the best conference, definitely the best conference so far in the tournament. I'm going to pick North Carolina to beat Alabama. RJ Davis has looked very good. Uh, Baycott has looked good. Uh, Clemson, Arizona. I'm going to go with Arizona. Caleb Love as well. He's looked pretty solid so far. Arizona's struggled a little bit in this tournament, but I expect them to be able to get it done. Uh, I think the refs are going to want the rematch. I think the NCAA is going to want the rematch of North Carolina versus Arizona which I'm going to stick to what I had in my bracket. Uh, I'm going to stick with Arizona beating North Carolina to go to the Final Four in Phoenix. Uh, I think that'd be a really fun game, obviously, for the R.J. Davis, uh, Caleb Love drama or whatever was there, but that'll just be a fun game to watch. But I got Arizona edging them. Um, yeah, I'm, one thing I am noticing is we're filling out these Sweet 16 and on brackets, and I'm comparing it to the brackets that we filled out last week before the game started is I'm not really changing many of my pre-tournament stances that I had. Um, this region here, the South, that we're about to get to will be the only region region that I have a different Final Four team than when I did a week ago when we made our brackets, and that's only due to the fact that Kentucky eliminated in the first round. Uh, but with that being said, moving on to the South region, Houston and Duke. I got Houston. Duke is a fraudulent team. Kyle Filipowski is not as good as everyone makes him seem. I saw a mock draft of him going in the lottery earlier today. I would be blown Bruce. away if he goes in the lottery. But I also said the same thing, I think, about uh, Jaden Daniels being top three in the middle of the college football season, and now he's most likely going to be. So I guess what do I know? But I'm um, taking Houston, well-rounded team. They're going to be able to clamp up Duke in that TikTok offense and move on to the Elite Eight. NC State and Marquette, as much as I really, really want to pick NC State, and I do want them to win very badly, like I said, I think Kolek might be the best guard in this tournament, arguably. Uh, and I just think Marquette has too much experience. I trust Shaka Smart uh, to advance past this. What? No, I just trust Shaka Smart in March is interesting. but hey, It is interesting, but bad. he also is an underrated. He is underrated. Up of plays. Like, if you, need a, if you need a big shot, he can get you the open shot. He can't make him make it. But, I mean, we saw it against what was the one... Uh, who did they play in the Big East? Uh, Villanova. Yeah, that was the a great play. play. Phenomenal. There. I mean, too bad it didn't count, but it was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah too bad it didn't count. But um, I guess this is where my trust will end for Shaka Smart as I have Houston beating them in the Elite Eight and going to the Final Four. Uh, Houston, I think, is one of the two best teams in this tournament along with UConn. And I'm, even though I tend to lead the uh, in March, the teams that have a lot of offensive prowess and teams with the best guards, as much as I do love Cryer and Shed, which. Um, it's March and I've learned that his name was Shed and not Sheed for the first time, but shout out to Shed. Um, they do have good guards. I know there's been some slander on whether they're only considered good guards because they're, uh, on one of the best teams, but I do think they are elite guards, maybe not Kolik level, but they are elite. I think they beat Mark out here. I think they have the uh, perimeter defense to be able to shut down guys like Kolik on Marquette and move to the final four to play whoever. Uh, Houston and Duke uh, I'm not going to overthink this I'm kind of in your boat I don't think Duke is that good even though they had two convincing wins in a row I think Houston is my best team in the tournament so I got Houston over Duke and just for shits and giggles I'm going NC State over Marquette uh, I just I think it's going to be cool to see or to potentially see an 11 seed kind of just going at it in the Elite Eight. And who knows, maybe we see them beat Houston, but it's going to be hard for me to pick against Houston at all in this tournament, especially since they are no longer going to be facing Kentucky. So I got Houston advancing to the final four out of the South region. Yeah, I have Houston beating Duke as well. Uh, they're my national champion pick. They had me nervous uh, this weekend, almost lost, but they have veteran experience. They've been here before. Uh, I think they're going to be able to get it done against Duke, who's got a lot of young guys on their team still. I love their guards defensively. As long as they don't get in too much foul trouble, they should be okay. And then NC State Marquette, I'm with you, Josh. I want to pick NCA, NC State so badly, uh, but I'm going to go with Marquette. Shaka Smart, it's been 12 years since he's been in the Sweet 16. He's finally back. Uh, 
just feels like so long considering, like you said, he's such a good coach. Uh, is he a conference tournament merchant? Maybe. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah maybe. <laughs> but hopefully he can continue the success in the actual tournament. This Marquette team is one of the best teams he's had. Uh, and then Houston versus Marquette. The Big East has been phenomenal so far in the tournament. They haven't lost. They're all three of their teams, Creighton, Marquette, and uh, UConn are all still in. Uh, but I'm going to go with Houston. They're my national champion pick. Like I said, I think their defense is going to be able to shut them down. Uh, just like the Duke game, as long as they don't get in too much foul trouble, I think they should be able to win win this game. We saw them get in foul trouble against Texas A&M. They were somehow able to overcome it in uh, overtime. Uh, but I like this Houston team a lot. Yep. And uh, Marquette, we can't forget that if they do need a sixth defender, we've seen Shaka Smart get out there and play defense That's true. <laughs> earlier this season. So they do have that slight advantage. But um, moving on to our final region here, the Midwest, Purdue and Gonzaga. Uh, I got to say, um, I'm nervous for Purdue uh, in this game. I think what they showed me in the first weekend makes me feel more confident about them than if they just, let's say, Let's say they just beat Grambling by what they beat them by 28, I think. And mm-hmm. then they played Utah State and won that game by like six. Then I think I look at this Gonzaga game a lot different. And I'm like, well, Gonzaga's a great three point shooting team. They could always get hot and beat Purdue. But I will say one thing about, like I said, Gonzaga chucks a ton of threes. That's just what they've been doing all year. They play an NBA style offense. Purdue allows 31% from three to their opponents. Not, um, the best you've ever seen, but not great by any means. So I think they'll be able to stop Gonzaga there. And what they showed me in the first weekend is that they're not scared of this moment. At least they're not scared yet. And they had every reason to be scared in that first game. So um, I'm taking Purdue to beat Gonzaga. uh, And I might not have done that had they not blown out Utah State the way they did on Sunday. Uh, And then Creighton and Tennessee, I'm sticking with my opinion. I think Hulk Brenner is just going to be too much down there for Tennessee guards driving at the rim. They're going to need guys like Ziegler and Vescovy, who've been there for 28 years, to make some threes. Um, I'm ready for next year when the COVID year is no longer a thing and we don't have guys like that in the league. But um, I think Creighton gets that win over Tennessee. I'm very confident in this Creighton team. And with that being said, uh, like I like I said earlier, I'm picking three of my same comp- or region winners, and I'm going to go with Creighton to beat Purdue. Uh, just the Colt Brenner is the only thing. Three-time Big East player of the year. He's the only, only the third player to win that uh, with Ewing and Alonzo Mourning, I believe, uh, to win that three times. Um, he won it three times. He's an insane rim protector. I think he'll be able to be the anti ED, uh, which most teams in this tournament do not have a guy that can be the anti ED. Creighton does. I think matching up with them uh, is a nightmare matchup for the Purdue Boilermakers. Uh, but that leaves my final four at UConn, Arizona, Houston, and Creighton. And I'll, I'll, I'm not going to go deep into these because they're hypothetical games, but. I'm taking UConn and Houston, and then UConn to be Houston for, to go back to back for the first time since the 06 07 Gators, I believe, is the years, or is it 07 08? I always forget. I think it's 06 07. All right. Well, so for Purdue and Gonzaga, you know what? I'm just going to skip the fanfare. Uh, I got the same Elite Eight matchup as you, Josh, Purdue and Creighton. I think in my in the last episode, I picked Tennessee over Creighton, but I've been really impressed with what Creighton has done. And like you mentioned, Josh, I think they just, they're going to match up well against. Uh, Tennessee, and they're going to match up well against Purdue. However, I do think Purdue, they're just playing so well. Maybe these last two games have been a fluke. It's just going to be hard to pick against the one seed. Uh, I'm just, I'm going Purdue just to play it safe, I guess you can say. If Creighton was a double digit seed, I mean, maybe I'd pick them, but I, I got to go Purdue here. It hurts a little bit, but I think Purdue advances to the final four. Yeah, Purdue versus Gonzaga. This is, in my opinion, the hardest game for me to pick out of all of these games so far. Uh, we saw this game earlier this year in November. Purdue won by 10. Uh, close game. But uh, Purdue is very good in the regular season, as always. Uh, Zach Eady versus Graham E.K. is going to be a very big matchup, obviously. I think whoever wins that matchup is going to win the game. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pick Purdue, but... I don't think this Gonzaga team was playing that good in November, and that's when Purdue seems to play some of its best basketball. So uh, only winning by 10 is a little interesting, but I'm going to pick Purdue. I'm going to trust them. They were one of the best teams in the regular season. We've seen so far chalk brackets do very good. Uh, No one seed's lost. Uh, I I feel like you have to pick a one seed to lose here soon, but um, Creighton versus Tennessee, kind of for the similar reasons as you guys. I got Creighton winning uh, Creighton versus Purdue in the Elite Eight. Uh, I think Kalkbrenner is going to have a big game. Like you said, Trey Alexander has been phenomenal. Baylor Shireman has been great. 
And Dalton Connect hasn't had a very good tournament so far. Hasn't really shown me much to expect him to turn it around this quickly. So I think Creighton's going to find Wildly a way to win. Inefficient. Yeah. Who, who could have predicted uh, that? <laughs> I'm going to take my small, <laughs> small wins in this tournament. <laughs> yeah. That, Reed Shepard was phenomenal in the first round. I said, um, I said I'm going to take my small wins. There's some else in there, true, but I'm going to take my small wins. <laughs> but I'm going to stick with the Big East, so I got Creighton over Tennessee. And then Purdue versus Creighton. I can't believe I have this. I have Purdue going to the Final Four and beating Creighton. I think Zach Keady is... Boy, what Purdue has shown me so far in this tournament, uh, first round I was a little nervous, but in the second round, they came out and dominated. They were hitting their shots. And if they can do that, there's really... I don't know if there's a team that can beat them in the country. Maybe UConn. Uh, if they play like they did against Utah State, they can win the whole thing. But yes, 100%. Will they do that? I don't know. So I got Purdue going to the Final Four, and uh, I'm usually not a fan of like chalk brackets where you have all the one seats in the final four, but it seems like I have a one, two, one, one in the final four here. I know the average is usually like nine and a half or 10. So, but this year has been different. We've seen a they're lot of good teams, the top seeds winning. And, that bad. Yeah, they're good teams. It's, I hate that. I can't make fun of Shannon Sharp's all four <laughs> ones bracket. Cause that yeah. could happen. He had, four one, one. he had eight <laughs> ones. He had the eight ones. So. That's true. Uh, but I think all the women's ones want this weekend they, too. Their numbers yeah. probably their numbers probably pretty low for their average. That's true. I would assume uh, theirs has got to be like six or something. Shannon just knows something that we don't. Yeah, that could be. <laughs> it's pretty low though when you think about it. You said it's usually combined eight. Uh, it's like nine and a half or ten. It's that's like pretty that. low though when you think about it. But that's just like one or two. I mean, that's like you get like two one seeds, seeds, two and then five six, and then like a yeah, an eleven, a ten or eleven, and then like a five. Not four, a ten six. or eleven. He said eight. He said they're the. No, I know, but no, but you have like a like two within the top three seeds, and then a uh, like a four, five, or six, and then like a ten or eleven. That would for be the like, average. I'm lost here now. <laughs> yeah, that'd be like that'd be like fifteen. He's saying the combined numbers, so eight would be like eight one. plus two plus one. Oh, plus I one. thought you meant the average. Oh, okay. No, 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 not the average of C. That would be crazy. Yeah, gotcha. no, he means like the total number of the. Yeah. yeah ah, got... okay. Okay, then yeah, eight seems right. It's yeah. interesting though. I never thought of it like that. <laughs> but do you finish that region? No. Yeah, I got Purdue going to the final four. I had one more thing I wanted to say, but I have lost it. Go off then. <laughs> I, I got two things. Yeah. Oh, I to say. oh, I got that's what it was. Um, say Gonzaga beats Purdue. Uh, we talked about the oh, Caleb yeah. Love rematch versus Arizona. We'd get a Nemhard rematch versus Creighton after he ditched them to go to his brother's school in Gonzaga. So, a couple possible revenge games in the Elite Eight. It's not even his brother's school either. His brother ditched Florida. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> no loyalty in the family. No, in the Nemhard <laughs> family, zero loyalty. Yeah, that's all I got. I got two things to say before we kind of wrap it up. Uh, one, or they're both actually completely different sports. One of them is Betsy got a power play assist, so we love oh, to see beautiful. it. Beautiful, just now. Uh, like two or three minutes ago. I missed that. And Let's then go. also two or three minutes ago, Jordan Montgomery agreed to terms with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Oh yeah, that's a lefty pitcher for us. <laughs> oh, so, in the show, yeah, it is a lefty yeah. pitcher for us in the show. Let's go. I was like, us? What the fuck? <laughs> okay, yeah, good for um. Good for them, I guess. Yeah, yeah MLB, I mean, MLB opening day is Thursday. I guess we can mention that. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> we can talk yeah. about a couple things next week. Yeah, we can do have, our we can do we're our. We're gonna MLB, have less March Madness games to talk about as well. We can do our MLB preview like three weeks into the season. Yeah, I'll give I'll give yeah. a hint. The White Sox suck. The White yeah. Sox are terrible. <laughs> How would you um, feel if, and, they, oh, if they? I guess there was breaking news in the MLB that we didn't talk about. Oh, um, Shohei Otani and his translator, EPA or whatever. Yeah. Possible gambling. I'll uh, say problems. I feel for him because this is the best gambling month of the year, and getting got this month is brutal. Yeah. So I'll say I do feel for him a little bit. Four point five million dollars. Um, they said oh. they said Otani bets, but he's still a free man. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> um, and then there was the the Raptors player. Oh my gosh, I can't think oh, of his name. His brother. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that too. I didn't know. I honestly didn't even really know him. It's Michael Porter Jr.'s brother. John Tay Porter. Yeah, yeah. Michael Porter Jr.'s brother was caught That's allegedly. I think so, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Really? Allegedly gambling on himself and purposely winning a bunch of money. Oh, is... See, I saw that, but I, I want to know. Like, taking he was taking his unders? Wanna... He was He's taking his. Unders? Okay, what he would do is he would take his. This is what they have so far uh, from what I've seen on Twitter, which uh, you never know. But 
he would go into the game. He would bet all of his unders, really. He would play like four minutes and then he left the game with an eye injury. Oh, that's devious. <laughs> and the biggest winner on that sports bet of the night was John T. Porter's like under in points and under in rebounds was the biggest win of the night. And then it happened again like a week later where that's he left crazy. the game with like a, a sickness is what it was. And the biggest win of the night was John T. Porter under. And who is betting on John T. Porter? <laughs> yeah, bro, wow. nobody. Wow. <laughs> See, like you can get away with that if you're like LeBron. Yeah. Because like that you're gonna fall like he had to know that like him and his boys or whoever he's telling are the only people placing bets on John. And you gotta th- and you gotta think these unders are set at like one and a half assist, four yeah, and a half points. Has to, be, has to be being that confident to put insane money on Jothe Porter under one and a half assist. <laughs> no, is it, crazy. It, there was no, also, gotta be even less because if he's only getting four minutes, like there's no way yeah. he's actually there was also well, four minutes before he got hurt. Yeah, right. Oh, there's a God, video. Of him hitting a three, right? And he banked in the three. So it almost like oh, it was the and they, they put the camera on him after he hits and he looks upset. Like, oh. <laughs> it looks like the face of a man who lost some money. So being pissed <laughs> off that <laughs> you made a shot because you lost. Josh money. sees that in the mirror every morning. I was about to say that kind of sounds like my idol. Yeah. He I was, was the thinking, biggest... what if what if I would have known? Couldn't have slid that information to your boy. Multiple betting accounts attempted to place wagers of about ten thousand to twenty thousand on Porter's under in the game <laughs> against the Clippers, which is crazy because I'm pretty sure there's like two thousand dollar limits on player props, so they had to have been doing it from multiple accounts. That's what it's. That's why it says yeah. multiple betting accounts. Yeah, interesting. Uh, that's crazy. Safe Very to say. Interesting. Uh, his two way contract is at four hundred fifteen thousand. I hope that those couple. Not unders enough, got, I guess. A couple unders got him to that point. Yeah, I feel like they probably take that money away. Oh, I'm seeing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar getting ready for his game. He's locked in. He's Go locked six. in. They'd be playing this weekend if it wasn't for uh, Virginia. Yeah, for UVA. Ouch. Couple but times. that about does it for this episode of the Engage 8 pod. We will be back next week to talk about our final four teams, uh, as well as I think that's when we'll do the NFC, AFC North recap because we've been putting that off for a couple of weeks because of March Madness. So we'll be doing both of those next week uh, on one of the days. I'm not sure when. But um, until then, hit all of our links in the description for all of our social medias and whatnot. And we'll see everybody in the next one.